Chapter 24, Psychiatry and the Law Initially, we had no medications or pharmaceutical industry to drive us crazy. Patients were placed in asylums. The asylums had gained an awful name for themselves, and quite rightly so, as they degenerated into bedlam. Initially, an asylum was in the sense that we use for political asylum. It was a place that one could go and find refuge. The psychiatric patient of yore could simply drop out and find respite in a nice sheltered environment, most probably in the local monastery cared for by loving clerics. At the same time, there was another word, hospice. From the word hospice, we evolved into a hospital, and the psychiatric institutions have since oscillated between hospital and asylum. Before the so-called pharmaceutical revolution in the 1950s, hospitals themselves were asylums and called by that name. Then it was felt that the magic bullet arrived, and it was only a matter of time to find the right target somewhere in the patient's mind. Then the patient would throw away their crutches and walk away head aloft. Unfortunately, the only good thing that came out of it was the pharmaceutical industry and a lot of rich people. More and more of us are aware that medication is becoming another word for chemical straitjackets. It is not nearly as effective as claimed to be, and certainly is badly tolerated by the patient. We have reached a situation whereby the patient, who may be ill but not suffering is subjected to chemical straitjacketing and is suffering. At first, society deemed it was possible with the impending but certain revolution promised by the pharmaceutical companies to liberate those from the asylum into the community. Unfortunately, in most cases the community could not replace the asylum. There was a population shift from the closed back wards in an asylum into the closed cells in the local prisons. Society, via the lawgivers, were given to regard removing the patient from the asylum into the community as some kind of liberation. It was immediately tied in with the movement of civil rights and basic human rights. Nobody is denying the patient his rights. Certainly not amongst the psychiatric profession. Any claims that paternalism made with regard to my profession, in my opinion, are true. Nevertheless, as society has accepted universality of care, society should accept that some patients need asylum, and we cannot pretend that they don't. Laws and pompous statements will not make it go away, even if we want it to. We should have gone into the asylums and made them more humane and more open. Instead of that, we throw the baby away with the bathwater and set about smashing the bath. More and more, the psychiatric profession is being hounded by the legal profession, who claim to be the only ones who care about the well-being of the patient and his rights. If the patient were to sign any other document, he would be protected by the law, and whoever signed for the patient would be prosecuted. However, on being hospitalized, he is asked to sign such form. If he refuses, then we are to decide if the patient should receive compulsory treatment. The law demands that the patient is ill or dangerous, and there is no alternative treatment. Here start the problems. Medicine and the psychiatrist can only ascertain danger in the terms of probability. As doctors, we can predict what the probabilities are of you are having a heart attack. We can't say if you will have one or not. Similarly, a patient may be terminally ill, but we cannot ascertain the time and what day the patient is going to die. We deal in probabilities. We will tell you how many patients amongst a hundred patients will do a certain thing or undergo a certain act. The legal profession, for some strange reason only known to themselves, has decided that we must talk in certainties. It is not enough for a patient who is known to have used a knife in the past to attack his parents to threaten his parents, but he must pick up the knife and actually hold it for him to be hospitalized against his will. In Israel, once the patient is in hospital, the level of danger is not ascertained by his illness and the situation into which he will be discharged, but we are ascertaining what his immediate behavior was in hospital. In other words, the legal profession has adopted the non-compliant patient's claim that if the treatment works, then you can stop taking it because it's worked. It hasn't worked and why take it anyway? Unfortunately, when the patient is in such a situation where he needs treatment, be it compulsorily or not, once he is receiving treatment, the decision-making should not be done in an adversarial atmosphere. The decision should be consensual, and far more important, if the patient has already been deemed not to be responsible at the time of hospitalization, then he should have a legal guardian appointed until he is discharged. I firmly believe that if we have taken away from the patient his right to liberty because he's dangerous, 
then the patient has a right to be placed in the situation where this eventuality of reoccurring is lessened in real terms. We must avoid what is happening so often. The patient is returned to hospital very quickly because he was discharged too quickly using defective legalistic logic. Having worked for over 15 years in these committees, I am becoming more and more convinced that they must be improved. Of course, the patient must receive what is best for him, and the psychiatric services should act in accordance with the law. For this to happen, there is a legal advisor in every hospital, and he should be ascertaining that the letter of the law is being followed. There is no need for an external legal auditing system, which far too often enters into subject it has no idea about, and it tampers with things that should be left to the psychiatrists. Far too often, the legal component of any committee regards itself as a savior of the patient and the rectifier of all things evil in psychiatry. The committee should investigate, not only if it was right for the patient to lose their liberty, but on doing so, what plans are being made to get the patient back into the community? The committee should ensure the patient has a voice in his own therapy. If the patient is forced into an unwanted patient-doctor relationship, then the committee must oversee the treatment, and in particular, to elicit cooperation with the therapist. The patient should not be vanquished, and the doctors should not be allowed to enjoy a neo-paternalism. Psychiatry must set its stall in order. This should be done by ethics committees and extension of the Helsinki committee seen in every general hospital. Of course, psychiatry should be monitored, but it should be monitored by the Ministry of Health and not by a crusading rampaging legal profession. I find no other place to mention this next issue. I will place it in this section. Of late, marijuana has become legalized. I want to answer my editor's question with regards to recreation and medical marijuana. For me, there is no great difference. I can almost hear the eyebrows shooting up. But, I will stand by my guns. All I see is a mega industry springing up. We have seen clinical trials in the past, and I have learned one thing. I do not trust them. We have been led astray far too often. Where money, profits and medicine meet, be skeptical and cynical. Above all, wait and see. Anecdotal reporting is often the harbinger of honesty. Most of my colleagues have many reservations and are far from gung-ho about the burgeoning tsunami-like trend. I can only speak personally. I believe it's an extremely bad thing to do. There can be no doubt that not every person with a potential of becoming psychotic will become psychotic. Not every psychotic will progress to become chronically ill. There is no doubt in my mind that those who use marijuana will precipitate and potentiate any psychotic tendency. The psychosis will be more severe in form, will last longer, and unfortunately, the chances that the patient cooperating in the absolute essential follow-up over five years will not do so. As more people are convincing themselves that marijuana is a medication, the neo-psychotics are convincing themselves that it is also very good alternative to traditional antipsychotic medication. I'm sure that research will show this as an ineffective alternative for several reasons. Firstly, nobody has a vested interest to do so, so, who's going to pay for the research? Secondly, we're talking about tendencies. If we are mainly going to examine the prevalence of psychoses, we probably won't find it having changed. If we look at all, we should be looking at length of stay in hospital, but this factor is esoteric as it depends very much on the willingness of the health provider to pay for the hospitalization. So, a natural pattern is very difficult to prove. On the other hand, suffice it to say that the deleterious effects of smoking were first noted anecdotally by doctors, and it took a very long time to show that this was true. On this controversial note, Let's start summarizing the book.